So our program tonight is 703 Church Street. It's history and its future. Our program tonight will be presented in three different parts. First, I'm going to give a very quick overview of the history of Methodists in Eudora and the history of the 703 Church building. The main part of our program will be uh, from Megan Brewery via Zoom, uh, and she's going to talk about the historical arch architectural significance of 703 Church Street. And then the third part will be, uh, we'll welcome G.W. Weld up here. G.W. Weld's here. He's the, the owner of the building, and he plans to talk about his interest in the building and his future plans for the building. So uh, the Methodists have had a presence in Eudora since 1850. The Reverend Dr. Abraham Still and his family, they were the first Americans to settle what would become Eudora. And uh, the Still family operated a Methodist mission called the Wakarusa Mission in Eudora, pretty close to where we are now. It was at 12th and Elm Streets. Um, but the mission was relatively short-lived. However, the city was established a few years later in 1857, and uh, many of the original uh, German families that settled in Eudora were uh, members of the Methodist faith. So two Methodist churches were established in Eudora during the community's early years, a German-speaking Methodist church and an English-speaking one. German was a very commonly spoken language in Eudora up until the early 1900s. The building at 703 Church Street was built between 1921 and 1924. Uh, it was home to the Eudora United Methodist Church from 1924 until 2006. The Eudora United Methodist Church was formed in 1924 when the English and German-speaking congregations merged. The new congregation needed a new, larger building, which they built at 703 Church Street to accommodate its members. 703 Church Street was built on what they called the Akron Plan, which was a popular way of constructing churches in the 1920s. The Akron Plan called for a central worship space to be flanked by Sunday school rooms that could be opened up. The church is typical of many built in that plan, a square structure with the entrance in one corner and uh, the pulpit in the opposite. The church had balconies with two sides. The balconies and the areas beneath could be closed off for Sunday school classes by lowering roll down wooden curtains and subsequently raised for worship participation. 703 Church Street's large basement with no obstructing supports was used to host community basketball games before 1940. Uh, they even had showers for the athletes in the building. Uh, Eudora's population, of course, tripled when they built the sunflower plant. Uh, hundreds of plant employees moved into Eudora, and there was a, an extreme housing shortage. Basically, in the uh, early 1940s, they uh, had some classes. They held classes in there because they couldn't accommodate all of the, uh, the students in the regular school building. So it was used for that in the early 40s. The, uh, the United Methodists met uh, at uh, 703 Church Street until their new building was built in 2006. At that point, it was sold into private ownership. i have been here since 2011, and for me, it was really sad to see the building kind of sit vacant and almost fall apart over the years. Um, I would say it was neglected during that time. You could say the building hit its rock bottom in May of 2022 when the building was the victim of a fire. Thankfully, the prompt response by the Eudora Fire Department prevented the fire from spreading and destroying the building. After the fire, G.W. Weld purchased the building and, and has had an interest in the building, which he can speak about here in a little bit. Um, and uh, without G.W.'s inter, uh, intervention, the 703 Church Street might not even uh, have a very promising future. Um, so we're very grateful that it uh, has an, a second life. I'm now going to introduce our main speaker for the night, Megan Brewery. Um, she is presenting via Zoom. Uh, Megan is a 2022 graduate from the University of Kansas School of Architecture, and she has worked at the architecture firm Hernley & Associates since 2019. We worked with Hernley & Associates back in 2012 when we were restoring our museum building, so I know, we know, I know Stan Hernley quite well. Uh, Megan is passionate about historic preservation and adaptive reuse of historical buildings. Megan is the project designer and historic preservation consultant for the Eudora United Methodist Church Project. Please welcome Megan. Everyone, perfect. Go ahead and share my screen. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off, like I said, because my internet is struggling. Um, okay. All right. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for that introduction, and um, thanks for the um, kind of just introduction into the building. Um, so we're just going to start 
Um, as I said, I'm going to be talking about kind of the architectural significance of the first um, Methodist Church of Eudora um, and why it looks the way it does. Um, so we'll just start with a photo of the building. Um, this photo is uh, from the 1950s. Um, as you can see, not much has changed from the 1950s to today. Um, just a few small things that I noticed, like there's now a sign outside the building. Um, obviously the fire took out some of the windows, but um, really not much has changed from when the building was first constructed to today. Um, and so that's great. It has a lot of historic integrity. Um, and so we're going to talk about that too. Um, but before we do that, I also wanted to show some images of the buildings that were um, used by the Methodists before this building. Um, so as Ben said, um, Methodists have a long history in Eudora, um, all the way back to the 1850s. Um, but the first structures built specifically for the Methodists um, weren't built until the 1880s. Um, so the Methodist, uh, German Methodist Church is on the left. It was built in 1881. Um, and then the English Methodist Church is on the right. Um, and this was purchased in 1886. Um, it was also called the Temperance Tabernacle, um, and it was located at 736 Church Street. Um, it's no longer existing. I guess either one of them are no longer existing. Um, but yeah, they're, they're kind of sim similar to each other, but not very similar to the existing Methodist Church. Um, you know, simple wooden structures with wood cladding, uh, a central um, tower. Um, but yeah, that's what they look like, in case anyone was wondering. Um, and then we'll go back to the existing building. Um, so yeah, why does it look the way it does? Um, I just kind of want to point out some things about it, you know, that are interesting to me. Um, right now we're on the, seventh, uh, the intersection of 7th and Church Street looking at the building. Um, you can tell that the, the two um, facades that we're looking at are pretty similar. They're like almost identical. Um, and some of the features that stand out to me are the stained glass windows on the building. Um, they're rectangular along the first story, but on the second story, they're pointed. Um, and yeah, so it's kind of an interesting um, thing to take note of. Um, and so uh, to start off with, we kind of have to understand um, some things about architectural um, religious trends that took place during the late 1800s and early 1900s to have a better understanding of this building. So um, throughout most of um, Christian history, uh, churches were built, designed on the cruciform plan, um, cruciform, crucifix, you know, the Christians, they, they love their cross. Um, so uh, this is an example of one actually in Lawrence. Um, they have a long, narrow nave um, that all faces the chancel. Um, sometimes they had columns along the side to help support second, second story spaces. Um, but this is how a majority of Christian churches were designed. Um, before the 1800s. Um, however, um, during the 1800s, um, religion was changing. Uh, we had the Second Great Awakening taking place. Um, and this was characterized by traveling preachers and a more energetic and emotional approach to Christian practice. Um, and so a key element of, of this movement were events known as revivals. Um, and these placed a greater importance on the spoken word and visual connection to the priest. And so um, this change in religious practice meant that the cruciform plan didn't really work um, for this new, new trend. Um, they weren't optimal for um, acoustics, they weren't optimal for um, visual connection. You know, the people at the back of um, the nave, they couldn't see the preacher very well, they couldn't hear very well. Um, they're kind of echoey. So um, architects had to change um, their inspiration um, from historic cathedrals and basilicas of you know ancient uh, of Europe um, to modern structures such as theaters and concert halls, um, which did place an importance on visual connection and acoustics. Um, so this is how the auditorium plan um, sanctuary was created. Um, and this is an example of of one, this is obviously the Eudora Methodist Church. Um, they started springing up around the 1830s, but they didn't become more popular until the end of the 1800s, around 1890, um, when they became widely popular, um, especially among Methodist churches. Um, so I think that's just something important to note. Um, and so some of the key features of auditorium plan sanctuaries is that they're designed on a centralized plan 
um, that often took place, uh, took the shape of a square or a rectangle or a circle. Um, they often had sloped uh, floors that sloped down towards the chancel to help um, give be better visual to the preacher. Um, and then they often incorporated balconies, again, for the visual connection as well. Um, so that was the first trend. The second trend in religious architecture um, takes us to Akron, Ohio, um, where they were also revolutionizing architecture. Um, so we'll take a look at the building that did this. So on the left, we have the first Methodist church of Akron um, as it was built originally. And then on the right, we have um, the addition to the building, which is where the Akron Sunday School comes from. Um, so it kind of has similar ideas to the auditorium plan sanctuary. It's um, designed off of a semicircle, um, but it kind of had this added component of classes that were all along the um, perith periphery of the uh, sanctuary. And this allowed um, for Sunday school classrooms to be divided out by age, and then also a flexibility of the space. So there could either be more seating in the auditorium or um, Sunday school classes could be going on and they would just shut the partitions um, between the two spaces to have separate separate, separate spaces. Um, and this design was actually um, created by a man named Lewis Miller around 1866. Um, he wasn't an architect, he was a wealthy inventor and industrialist, um, but he worked with the architects of the building um, to accomplish this, this idea. And it became very popular among churches, especially Methodist churches, um, for a long period of time. Um, but it did start to fall out of favor after um, maybe the early 19, uh, I guess late 1920s, um, when Sunday school again kind of had a shift in, in ideas and stuff. And so a lot of buildings were remodeled. So it's, it's important to note that like a lot of buildings don't have this plan anymore. And so it's special that Eudora has a building with an Akron plan Sunday school. Um, and so now, now that we've visited Akron, we'll come back to Eudora, um, where uh, W.E. Glover, the architect of this building, um, designed, designed the Eudora Methodist Church. Um, he was originally from Indiana, um, but he started his practice in Topeka, and as Ben said, got the um, bid for the project in the 1920s. And he took these ideas of the Akron Plan Sunday School and the Auditorium Plan Sanctuary and combined them to create um, this building. And if you kind of picked up on the trains, um, they don't really have a lot to do with the exterior of the building. They have more to do with the function and the interior of the building. And so that's why it takes on kind of this more cube shape. It's more just a box with some applied um, ornament onto it. And we'll talk more about the exterior later, but I just thought that was important to note too. Um, so now we'll look at the interior of the building a little bit closer. Um, with the Auditorium Plan Sanctuary and the Akron Plan Sunday School. And it was really common for architects to use these two types of plans together. Um, it was often called the combination plan. And so as I mentioned, um, this church, the First Methodist Church of Eudora, has a centralized square plan. Um, and it probably had radial seating. It doesn't have the pews anymore, but I could imagine that they were curved around the chancel and the auditorium. Um, it does have a sloped floor still to kind of bowl into the chancel to, to help people in the back have better um, visual connection. Um, it has stained glass. The stained glass kind of provides a natural diffuse light that um, just again enhances that visual um, connection. And then um, the balconies are kind of both part of the auditorium plan sanctuary and the Akron plan Sunday school in this case. Um, they, they create additional seating for the auditorium, but they have these rolling partitions that um, can be closed and separated off for the Sunday school classes. And so now we'll take a look at the interior of the building um, from the chancel looking towards the main entrance of the building. So you can see the balconies on either side. Um, on the right of my screen, um, one of them is kind of half closed, so you can start to see um, what I mean by having these rolling partitions that can close and shut off the space for a different use. Um, and while we're inside, we'll also just take a look at the stained glass because I think it's interesting. Um, it's very modern for a 1920s building, I think. Um, it has kind of an element of like prairie style um, with you know natural colors and more geom geometric shapes, although it does still have some religious um, symbolism in it as well, um, like the center panel on the, the three windows. Um, and then some of the windows were also um, 
given as memorials to different groups. And so the one on the right was a memorial for the women's group of the church. Okay, and now we've looked at the inside and talked about, you know, how it was designed the way it was. Um, we'll look more about on the exterior. Um, so I might have mentioned this earlier, but the building is um, collegiate Gothic style, um, Gothic revival style, Romanesque revival style. Um, these two are really common um, applied to auditorium plan sanctuaries because as I mentioned, they're like big masses, they're big, big rectangles. And so they just wanted to put something on there that um, showed the style easily without having to change too much of the volume. Um, and so in this case, it was collegiate Gothic rather than Gothic revival. And I think that has to do um, with the Methodist connection to education. They wanted something to kind of call back to that. I think if you're not paying attention to the stained class and some of the religious um, symbolism on the building, um, if you drive by, it kind of does look like a school. Um, so really strong collegiate Gothic style. Um, some of the more like ornamentational pieces that call out that style are the cast stone details of the building. Um, so you have the pinnacle at each corner. Um, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'll come to them if you can. If not, just look at each corner. Um, and then it has the decorative panel with finials at the uh, top um, of each uh, primary facade of the building. And then obviously the stained glass windows. Um, another thing to note about the stained glass windows, and you can kind of see it in in this picture here um, is they have these like tracery details. These larger panels of stained glass windows are divided um, with two smaller um, sections of stained glass at the top. And this is called a tracery detail. Um, it was really common on the Gothic revival style, um, but also collegiate Gothic style. It was more common to do in stone and more often curved than um, angular like these. Um, you can see it on like some of KU's campus buildings like the, the Watt Watkins Library um, has it, um, but or Watson, sorry, Watson Library. Um, but but yeah, this building has kind of more angular tracery, kind of more modernized style of it, which is unique. Um, so we'll just kind of walk around the building now and look at the different features. Um, so this is the north elevation. As I said earlier, it's pretty similar, almost identical to the um, east elevation. Um, that's because, you know, the building is set on a corner. It has two primary facades trying to be very strong presence on Church Street and 7th Street. Um, again, you can see the tracery details on the windows, um, the pinnacles, the, the finials missing on this side, but um, still very strong, you know, collegiate Gothic style. And as we keep walking around um, to the west elevation, you can start to see the back of the building um, and how that reads a little bit differently. Um, you have these tall windows along the ground level, um, and those kind of show that, you know, that's the double height space in the basement that Ben was talking about earlier where they played basketball and had different um, community events. Um, and then the smaller windows would be like offices or where the church or the library of the church was, but the big windows show you where the sanctuary is. So it kind of, again, is that uh, form follows function um, translation. And then this is the south elevation, similar to the west elevation with the basement windows along the bottom and the large um, stained glass window showing where that sanctuary is. <coughs> so as we come back to the front, um, uh, we're kind of looking towards the future of the building. Um, obviously, Ben said GW and I've been working together to come up with some future plans and GW is going to talk about the future of the building. Um, but if anybody has any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them um, before I turn it over to GW. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Is that the fire damage there? Uh, yes. I see the fire. Yes. All right, I think that does it. I don't see any other questions. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Megan. Ben, ben, ask, yes. Ask her if she has the renderings. Megan? Yeah? GW is asking if you have the renderings. Oh, I can pull them out real quick. I 
I'll introduce GW because GW is coming up next. Um, here, I got even a prepared introduction. <laughs> um, so, uh, GW and his wife Kathy own what seems like half of uh, downtown Eudora. They own the building on either side of our museum building. I personally couldn't be more grateful for that because they're great neighbors, but even more, I'm grateful that they've saved uh, and re rehabilitated so many buildings in Eudora. They significantly rehabilitated 707 and 724 Main Street, and they've completely saved 714 Main Street, which is where the uh, ice cream store is now. That building's the oldest building in downtown Eudora, and I never imagined that building would have been saved. So thankfully, there was a $250,000 grant that helped with that, but I'm sure that didn't cover all the costs, so I'm sure it was still an enormous project. Uh, and now thriving businesses exist there, which um, help bring thousands of people into downtown Eudora. So uh, I deeply appreciate the work that GW and Kathy have done in Eudora, and I think the entire community has as well. So please welcome GW. Thanks, Ben. Never been formally introduced before, I don't think. So. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate it. Well, I know most of you, so I won't tell you a lot about my story. I grew up here in town. My dad pastored the Assembly of God Church downtown, so I, I grew up downtown. And uh, I often tell people when I was a kid in the early 90s, you know, downtown had some things going on. We had a grocery store, we had a hardware store, we had things to do, places to eat, and, uh, you know, we rode our bikes all over town and, um, you know, felt like maybe it wasn't as vibrant as it was in, in the 50s and 60s, but there, there were things to do. But as, as I grew up, downtown really died, I felt like, um, you know, hardware store left, grocery store left. That happens so often with communities when the highway is built in a different location than went where it was traditionally. But what's so unique about our town and, and also small towns across America is we've, we've got this beautiful downtown with architecture and history and stories of people that have owned these buildings, people that have operated businesses, people that have shopped in these locations. And you can't replicate that with new construction. I, I'm all for progress and I'm involved in some new construction projects also, but I, I totally appreciate the aesthetic and the architectural significance of our history. And um, luckily when I bought 714 Main Street, uh, I actually had no idea what I was getting myself <laughs> into. Um, totally un, unfeasible financial project, but we had bought it and luckily that made me learn a little bit more about grants, historic tax credits. Unfortunately, I didn't know Stan and Megan at that time, and so I had to learn the hard way. Uh, that would have made my life so much easier. Um, but I learned about some of the resources available for historic buildings, and so that's helped me. And um, since we've done some of these projects, we've been invited to some other communities. We've got a project going right now, and one in Atchison, one in Osawatomie, one in Paola. And uh, so it's been fun to kind of spread the learning uh, to some of those other towns and see some exciting projects. But um, to be totally frank with you, this is the most challenging project that I have on my plate. Um, we bought this building um, after the fire. I remember the day the fire happened. Uh, Don Bradshaw, many of you know him, he called me and, was, and Kathy and I walked over and saw it burning. Uh, as the firemen put it out. And they did a great job putting it out quickly uh, to salvage a lot of the building, but um, there was extensive damage to the building, and um, so there's always challenges with historic restoration. Um, a fire makes them more challenging, but some of the conventional challenges are we have to bring building now to current building code, so uh, sprinkler system, new elevator, ADA accessibility, um, so there, there's a lot of challenge, challenges and costs that come with that, and when you add the fire uh, damage to it, it, it's a very expensive project. But I started thinking about what do I want this building to be, and um, what what came to I, I wanted something that was available for the community because I I, I never liked that it was privately owned and uh, it was a, a private residence for almost 20 years. People haven't been able to go there and enjoy the architecture. So I wanted it to be something that was open to the public and uh, as I thought about it and did some research what, what came to me was the best option for it would be to be a wedding venue uh, because it's it's laid out perfectly for that. It's an auditorium space, it's got great acoustics, it's got beautiful architecture 
And uh, after extensive research, apparently people pay significant amounts of money to <laughs> get married in beautiful buildings. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I'm curious, is anyone here tonight, did anyone get married in that building? Yeah, okay, great. So I think that's a big part of our community story, right? And uh, I think there's, there's dozens of people in our community that were married there, or uh, certainly hundreds that uh, attended church there at one point, and uh, it's a significant place to our community. So, so I want it to be a place that uh, people can go and, and be there. Uh, and Megan, is, uh, it, were you able to find those renderings? Um, I found a couple of them. Okay. So she's put a couple of things together, what, what the vision is that it could look like. Here, I'll show the exterior one. Can you see that? Yeah, great. Okay. So this doesn't change really anything about the exterior of the building. Obviously, the stained glass gets repaired, um, do some really nice landscaping on the building, and kind of rebuild the, this is a, addition right now uh, that was a stair structure <coughs> to the basement so we kind of redesigned that to make it look a little better with the uh, historic nature of the building. So the outside doesn't change a lot. Do you have any of the interior? Yeah, I have the one of the um, auditorium space. Okay. Oops. Can you see that? Yeah, that's great. Okay. So that, that's the vision to you know keep keep the layout but repair it all and, and make it look as close to original as possible. And um, I've had uh, some wedding consultants, wedding planners, uh, people in the industry come out and verify that this would, would be something that would be very popular. Um, so, so I feel very good about the plan, but I'll, I'll just be totally frank with you, the costs of it are extremely high. And so that this has been a challenging project. Um, our bids came in, uh, for renovation of the building at about 1.2 million dollars. Um, there's some grant funding available and we're, we're prepared to make an investment in it but the other additional challenge is um, we, we had to go before the city and get a special use permit to use it as a, a wedding venue uh, because it's zoned residentially and um, so we fought pretty hard to get that special use permit and some of you showed up to the city commission meeting in support of it and I appreciate that. I don't think it would have happened without that because there were several commissioners that weren't so sure they wanted to see that happen in this place. Um, so I really appreciate the support of the community for that. So we do have a permit to use it as a wedding venue. However, uh, with the permit came some strings attached and I think they're requiring us stay in 60, 65 parking spaces and we have to build brand new parking lots, asphalt, curb, gutter, lighting, landscaping, everything. So uh, at the tune of, you know, something like five, six hundred thousand dollars in just parking lots. And we actually, the building came with no land. So there was nowhere to even put a parking lot. We were able to acquire the old parking lot across 7th Street to the north. Um, but we can only fit about 20 spots on that. Um, since then, I've been able to acquire a vacant lot to the west of the building um, that we can get another 20 spots. And then, uh, Mike, I've talked to you in St. Paul's about potentially doing some kind of lease option on your parking lot that's just a block away. Um, that could save a lot of money because we wouldn't, you know, it's an existing parking lot that we wouldn't have to, to build. So, but when you add all that up, you know, you're over $1.5 million and uh, it's just very difficult with interest rates, almost 8%, you know. Um, so we've looked at, you know, what are some scaled back options we could do and it's just really difficult because you have to sprinkle, you have to elevate or you have to repair the fire damage. The stained glass alone is $140,000. So um, it's, it's an expensive project. Um, however, you know, we, we feel like we're going to get it done. I don't know exactly how we're going to fund it all. Um, we've never raised money for a project before. so. That's something I've thought about. Uh, there's people in the community that really care about the building, and so um, we might put together a package and invite community members to invest something in the restoration of the building, um, just to, to try to bring those costs into something that is, is doable. Um, and I, I think the building would provide a great return uh, for people that would invest in it. Um, it's it's going to be a popular venue. As you can see, it's just beautiful. And, you couldn't build that for $1.5 million. You couldn't build it for $3 million uh, with, with everything that comes with it. And 
The basement is absolutely beautiful. It's It's got almost 20 foot ceilings. Um, so if you can imagine the reception venue, there's no columns or pillars or anything. It's totally wide open. Uh, it's an architectural marvel that they, I don't even know how <laughs> they did that, but um, it's, it's a beautiful building. Uh, it's part of our community's history and we wanted to buy it to make sure it didn't get torn down. And so um, I have people ask me every week, what's the status, what's the update on it? Um, I wish I had more of an update on it other than, you know, we're committed to seeing it preserved and not being torn down. And um, if, if the wedding venue doesn't become doable, there's probably some other things that could be done. Um, it, it could be a single family residence and renovated much more cost effectively than that, but that really would break my heart to see that. So, uh, so we continue to work for ways to fund it. You know, the, the economy is always changing. Interest rates are going to be coming down. Um, you know, and there's, there's always opportunities to, to raise some money and, and do some things for it. So, uh, luckily, we've got great plans that Hernley put together. We've got beautiful renderings. Uh, we've got a, a business plan that, that looks like it, it makes a lot of sense. And uh, I think this will bring a lot of people from out of town to our downtown. You know, we're only two blocks away from downtown. And uh, I can just imagine people coming in for a wedding and going, hopefully get a cup of coffee and uh, buy an ice cream cone and, you know, frequent maybe go shopping at some of our downtown businesses. So I, I think it's a great draw for our community. I think it's a huge part of our cultural heritage um, and uh, it, it's important to me that it's preserved so so those are my plans those are my challenges um, if you want I'd add, answer any questions people might have I don't know if you have any yes um, I'm, not, uh, I'm from yeah. and, uh, well, welcome uh, I haven't built all of the project but uh, as you saying right now that you just talked to building that uh, have there been any work done on already right now? Or? We haven't done any work other than to board it up and make sure it's secure. Okay. Um, so yeah, no, no work is happening right now. There's also quite a bit of mold in the building that needs to be cleaned up. Okay. Um, so yeah, there, we, we could go in and do some preliminary work just to clean it up a little bit. So we, that's, that's where we're at right now. Well, thanks. Yes. Have you talked about the tax credits and how that could yeah. tie in with Yeah, so uh, we have nominated the building to the National Register of Historic Places. I think, is it listed now? I think it, it either is listed or will be very soon. I think it's done. Okay, so Megan yeah, Megan knows, yeah. Is it listed, Megan? I think it is listed. So that, that allows us to... Uh, sorry, I couldn't find my funny button. Uh, it, I, uh, did you get a letter from uh, Shippa, <laughs> PW? Uh, I, I can't remember. <laughs> okay. Uh, last I heard, uh, we were. I had to send some revisions, um, and so okay. it might still be under review, but it should be yeah. getting listed soon. It's on the state register. Okay, gotcha. Well, the, the building obviously qualifies for the National Register. It takes almost two years, it seems like, to get it listed, actually. So uh, we started that process probably a year and a half ago. Uh, so it, it will be listed if it's not yet, and that allows you to access some federal and state tax credits, which you still have to front all of the capital to invest in the building, but then you can get some tax credit money back, which is very helpful. The state tax credit is, is a really good program. Um, so it would be a totally undoable project without that. And there's, there's also some other grants uh, that are out there for this type of project. Um, but we just we just have a, a funding gap of probably four or five hundred thousand dollars. So if we if we had that, you know, there's enough owners' equity, debt, tax credits to make it work. Um, so so we're looking at that, and uh, I haven't pitched that to anybody, but I, I think there are some people that would be interested in in investing in that, uh, both to get a financial return and to see the building restored. Um, so it's it's a passion project for me, and I think. Some people will share that, so I really need to start working on that a little bit more. So, yes. Um, as a lifer in yes. that church, yes. we both were um, probably been in every inch of it. But I was on the committee when we sold the yes. building initially, 
And honestly, our dream was for it to become an event center. Really? Yeah. And it wasn't a popular idea for the yeah. city of Eudora at the time. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, and I don't know if you know this, but the story goes, and this is lore, that every brick was bought with a pie. The ladies of the church <laughs> baked the pies, and when they sold them, and they bought the bricks. Really? That's the lore. That's amazing. I, yeah. I wasn't around then. Yeah. <laughs> My grandmother was. Really, wow, amazing. Yeah. Well, and it's stories like that that I love to hear because you know you, you could go build a brand new wedding venue that was beautiful and perfect, but nobody would have a story like that about it. Every big supply. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, thank you all for your interest in the building, and thanks Ben for letting me come and talk about it. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.